This is CBC Here and Now. I just want to say that I'm relieved that this is finally over and uh, I'm uh, extremely happy with the verdict today. And the verdict is not guilty. A jury delivers its decision and Stephen Neville is a free man tonight. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Debbie Cooper. And I'm Anthony Germain. We be Germain, we begin tonight with a shocking verdict in the retrial of Steven Stephen Neville. After eight days of deliberations, the jury has found him not guilty of second degree murder and attempted murder. Here and Now's Carolyn Stokes is live with the details. Carolyn, what happened in court? Well, Debbie, you could just hear the air get sucked out of the room when the jury read the verdict of not guilty. There were a lot of tears, tears of heartache from the family of the victim and uh, tears of relief from Neville and his family. For them, this marks the end of a nine year ordeal. Neville is now free and his innocence is publicly declared. Now, the 10 member jury took a long time to come to that decision. Eight days of deliberation for anyone following this trial. This verdict comes as a shocker. It is so starkly opposite to the verdict the jury reached when Neville stood trial on the same charges six years ago. Now, in that trial, he was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole for 12 years. But that conviction was overturned by the Supreme Court of Canada because of a technicality and a new trial. This trial was ordered and now Neville is not guilty of both charges. And today he says he's anxious to put this chapter of his life behind him. After nine years, uh, I went through a lot of stress with family members and I just want to say that I'm relieved that this is finally over and uh, I'm uh, extremely happy with the verdict today and I'm glad that my innocence has been proven. I got my heavy equipment and I'm looking forward to start my start a trade, start working and uh, have a great future. This is the first time in a long time that you have not had this cloud over your head. Uh, what are you going to do when you walk out these doors? Spend time with my family and uh, I guess plan and think about my future. Now for the family of Doug. This is not a time of rejoicing. This is a time of... Uh, by Neville in 2010. This can only be pure devastation. They all left the courtroom very quickly after learning the verdict. Some clearly angry, others visibly heartbroken. Defense lawyer Bob Buckingham says he was not surprised by the verdict. He has argued that Neville acted in self-defense when he killed Flynn and seriously injured another young man by stabbing him in the back. This is not a time of rejoicing. This is a time of, uh, of relief. I know it's difficult for, uh, you know, the Mr. Flynn's family, and that's uh, that's difficult. Uh, and uh, this is a uh, an unfortunate uh, event that happened with a bunch of young people many years ago, and um, and Mr. Neville gets the opportunity to get on with his life, and the other individual doesn't. It's unfortunate. It's sad, but at the end of the day. You know, Mr. Neville is not a criminal because of what happened here. <clears throat> and so hopefully he can become a productive member of uh, our community. Were you surprised this is the second time that uh, Mr. Neville has, has stood trial and it came back with a very different verdict the first time around? Uh, are you surprised that all charges dropped? No. I'm the only one in town who would probably say that, but no. Uh, and and uh, my team will tell you that I was overly optimistic. My a pie in the sky. I wasn't in touch with reality. And uh, so, but uh, I was happy with the strategy that we developed. And, uh, and so <clears throat> my problem was uh, what was going to happen if it wasn't a not guilty verdict. Now, Neville did spend five and a half years in prison, and most of that time he was waiting to be tried for the crimes that he's now been completely cleared of. But Buckingham says that there will be no opportunity to uh, look for any compensation or remuneration for that lost time. He says they just need to accept that sometimes the wheels of justice turn slowly. Reporting live from Supreme Court in St. John's, I'm Carolyn Stokes for Here and Now. 
Now, a story that we brought you last night has captured the country's attention. Yesterday, you heard about Michelle Rayner's immigration troubles. Well, after living here for eight years, Rayner believed that he'd be forced to leave, all for breaking a rule that he didn't know existed. And tonight, the, the Jamaican-born man is breathing a sigh of relief, for now at least. Here now is Ariana Kelland reports. If they enjoy doing something... Michelle Rayner is a fitness guy, a personal trainer by trade. But as the province and country heard his story, job offers and support began to pour in from all over. He even got a call from local police. The RNC was one of the first that came out to see what they can do because they need people, uh, people like me to be a part of their force. And he was walking me through all the recruitment stage. I was honored for that uh, call. Taking temporary work in Halifax hurt his chances at permanent residency. He was unsure whether he'd get to stay in Newfoundland or be forced to leave the country. But all that newfound support has the provincial and federal governments working on his case. No, I wasn't expecting this magnitude of support and the calls and texts from all aspects from the federal, provincial to the regular uh, citizens of Canada and Newfoundland. Rayner says the provincial government has helped in a huge way. He says restrictions on his work permit have been lifted, opening the door to any job opportunity that presents itself and lifting the financial burden his younger brother was prepared to shoulder. Now that I can actually help pay my bills and probably send a, a Christmas present for my family back home, for uh, this Christmas, so that is good that I can be able to continue to do what I came here to do, and I'm very grateful for that. Rayner says he stayed awake until 1.30 a.m., responding to messages offering him help and support. But there was one last person he needed to tell the good news, his mother back home in Jamaica. With tears in her voice that says, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus, you answered my prayers. And how does an entertainer turned personal trainer celebrate the news? <laughs> Ariana Kellen, CBC That's News, right. St. John's. <laughs> I'm still here. Everyone. There's been an oil spill today at the Come By Chance Refinery. North Atlantic Refining Limited says a pipeline leaked bunker oil into the harbor around 8.30 this morning. The company activated its emergency response protocols to contain the leak. It says less than one barrel of oil spilled into the water. That's less than 160 litres. There was a funeral today for the man who died after police shot him last week in Cornerbrook. 27-year-old Jordan McKay was killed last week while two officers were at his house. Police say there was a confrontation and he was shot. McKay died an hour later in hospital. The two officers have been put on desk duty during an investigation by the Ontario Provincial Police and the Alberta Serious Incident Response Team will also carry out a review. Well, eastern Newfoundland woke up to the first big blanket of snow. Around 14 centimeters landed in Gander, while 27 was reported in Mount Pearl and 26 at the St. John's Airport. It wasn't a warm welcome to Friday for many in St. John's this morning. The city was dumped on by Mother Nature. Shovels did their best to clear away what the first storm of winter left behind. With the on-street parking ban not yet in place, it was rather tight quarters on many downtown streets. City plows were out in full force, though. Yeah, so under 25 centimeters, the service standard is that we get to all streets for one cut, uh, at least one cut within 12 hours of the end of the storm. That becomes a lot more challenging for two reasons. One, when it, it breached 25 centimeters, almost 30 in some areas of the city. And secondly, because it was so close to the typical rush hour period, so it was still snowing into 7, 7.30 a.m. this morning. So that made it challenging to, to make sure streets were, were clear for everyone this morning. Well, a lot of snow, but it's really quite pretty. It's I mean, if you're If you're a fan of the snow, yeah. it's quite pretty, although it, it was very tight in certain parts. I forgot about the parking ban in St. John's. There's some streets you could see people. It's almost dangerous, actually. Yeah, yeah. It's St. John's streets in mm. the downtown. Mm -hmm. And the downtown actually picked up quite a bit more snow. I think it was showing about 33 centimeters. Oh. 
Uh, everywhere else was somewhere between 20 and 25 for the most part. But yeah, significant amount of snow and I hope you like it because <laughs> there's more on the way. Uh, if we take a look at the weather on the way through the weekend, we are looking at, a, like I said, another round of snow for parts of the Buren Peninsula. Could see as much as 20 more centimeters on the way. And then for parts of Avalon as well, more snow on the way for the west and northeast coast as well. That should fall somewhere between Saturday and Sunday. And then blizzard conditions for Labrador expected right through the weekend. We already have uh, those blizzard warnings in place. You can expect somewhere between 30 to 50 centimeters of snow for parts of the coast and those gusts somewhere between 60 to even 100 kilometers per hour at times. So definitely a dangerous weekend, but I will have all those details and your full forecast coming up in a little bit. I'm Jane Aidy here in the harbor in Port de Grey for the 20th annual boat lighting. We'll have all the Christmas color coming up on Here and Now. Was Andrew Panachoe's shed serving as a makeshift casino? The former chief of the Shehushi Innu First Nation faces charges of running an illegal gaming house. And it all stems from a search warrant that police executed in September. Jacob Barker now with the details. Well, there are nine counts listed on these court documents, and they say that Panashaway kept an illegal gaming house contrary to the criminal code of Canada. It was on September 28th. RCMP say they executed a search warrant on a shed adjacent to a house in Sheshashi. Police said at the time that 11 video lottery terminals, like those you may see in a bar, were seized. A bingo device and an ATM were also taken. The court information alleges that 52-year-old Panashaway operated the video lottery system without approval from the Atlantic Lottery Corporation and that ALC decals were not affixed to the machines. He's also charged with keeping a 22 caliber rifle without a proper license. Along with the alleged contraventions of the Canadian Criminal Code and Lotteries Act, the charges also state that he broke a bylaw of the Sheshashi Innu First Nation by operating a video lottery on the reserve. At the time, RCMP said they'd work directly with members of the community and the band council, and that important information had been gathered from Facebook. Well, Panashaway has run as chief before, and he ran in the past two elections, but lost. He's expected in court in early February to face the charges. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Happy Valley Goose Bay. The only recycling facility in central Labrador has found a new home in an old arena. The Happy Valley Goose Bay Recyclers Group had been operating out of the back of a local bakery, but after a string of structure fires, the building's owner did not want them storing recycling there anymore. The town won't bring in curbside recycling, so volunteers are working to keep paper, plastic and tin cans out of the local landfill. The grassroots group will hold its first collection on Sunday. The Team Guju Highway Extension is now open, finally. The Department of Transportation removed the barricades and opened the highway to traffic today. The road extends the Team Guju Highway between Kenmount Road and Topsail Road. Now, it was supposed to open on Monday, but wet weather last week prevented crews from finishing the line painting. Lots of praise on social media for the new highway. Now, before all that with the line painting, it was originally set to open four years ago. The four kilometer stretch of road cost about $59 million to build. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of happy people though that it's, it's finally true. open. Yeah. <laughs> so it is about to get a whole lot brighter in Port Grave tonight. Okay, yeah, of course, as you probably know, or a lot of us do, the town is gearing up for a big annual event. This is the 20th annual boat lighting ceremony. Jane 80, host of CBC Radio's The Broadcast, is there tonight, as you saw earlier. So, Jane, thousands of people travel to Port de Grave to see these lights each year. How are things tonight? They do, and uh, there are lots of people up at, the, up at the end of the harbour. But we wanted to be in a spot where we could show you a lot of the lights. So we're down at the end of the harbour. Now, earlier today, uh, I spoke with the organizer, Joyce Morgan, who's been organizing this event for 20 years. Let's remind people how it all started. It all started back in 1999 when the government put out a grant 
$500 for people to light up their communities. So previous to that, there was a gentleman, Eric Lear, used to light up his boat. So anyway, we came up the brain wave about, let's light up the full arbor. So from that, it just spiraled. Yeah. yeah. And so every year, I guess you've been getting more and more interest. Tell me how many boats take part. We are, we're averaging between 50 to 60, and tonight we should be lighting up probably 58, I think. Now, unless somebody else light, put lights on today that we don't know of. <laughs> and I remember from when I did the Land and Sea Story that there are actually boats that come from other harbors to participate. Has that happened this year, too? Yeah, we got them here from Labrador and Portugal Cove and the West Coast. Okay, they just they just want to be a part of it. They just want, well, when they come, they, yeah. yeah. I'll make sure to get the lights on. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so you've seen this now grow over 20 years. Tell me what has changed uh, in this tradition. You see a lot of people, I guess, come to the harbor. People traffic is the most, uh, is just amazing, like how many people that come down here during the Christmas season. How many do you think? We figure between 30 to 40,000 from December, that will happen between December the 6th, uh, 7th and January the 6th, all Christmas Day. Wow. Wow, tens of thousands, so they just come, make their way around the harbor. I guess lots of them get out, take pictures. Yeah, they come and they park. Sometimes you can't get through the people, the traffic, and they just walk around and they with their families, and it's just so nice. At what time can we expect to see the lights go on? The lights will be going on around quarter to seven. Okay. All right, thanks, and congratulations again on 20 years. Thank you, Jane, and thanks for coming back. Okay, so as you heard, uh, in a few minutes, probably about 15 minutes, all the lights will be on, so stick around. We're hoping to give you a really nice scene in the harbor here in Port de Grey. Back to you, uh, Debbie and Anthony. Okay, Jane, no question. We'd uh, definitely like to, see, I like to see that actually in person. I think next year you and I should go and we do the show both, from there, right? We were both saying we've never been there for that event, so mm -hmm. that sounds like right. a good plan. But stay tuned, though. We'll see it when they throw the switch a bit later with Jane 80. Well, we were there live last night, but we didn't get to be this close to it. Up next, see five-year-old Natalia Williams flip the switch and turn on the Confederation Building Christmas lights.
Hi, I'm Ashley Brawweiler with a special report, a forecast of need. Here in Newfoundland and Labrador, more than 6,000 food hampers will be provided to the less fortunate. In the spirit of giving this holiday season, expect a noticeable warm front to move through the province. Join us in raising funds for the Community Food Sharing Association and local food banks throughout December. There's a 100% chance of making the holidays brighter. Visit cbc.ca slash feednl to donate today. time now for another look at the weather and before we get to the weather Ashley during that storm last night a tree lighting ceremony was held at Confederation building mm -hmm. uh, and our Carolyn Stokes was there sideways sideways <laughs> here's a look at the big moment Five, four, three, two, one. And there she lit the tree. That was five-year-old Natalia Williams flipping the switch, turning on 60,000 lights on that tree, and of course, up and down the parkway as well. Natalia is from Labrador City. She's in St. John's getting treatment for leukemia, and she was absolutely delighted to be chosen for that honor. And uh, as we saw from yesterday, it was windy and stormy out there, so there wasn't much of a chance to enjoy the lights, mm -hmm. uh, as you can imagine. So the outdoor portion of the ceremony lasted only a few seconds, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, they all f and then they all <laughs> went, went right back, back in inside. for the hot chocolate. Yeah, <laughs> that's where I would have been. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So we had, of course, you were talking about uh, the storm that was the first one here in the eastern part of the province. Mm -hmm. And just remind us again how much snow we got. It was quite significant and, and you know, believe it or not, it's actually downtown St. John's that had the most amount of snow. So take a look at these numbers, about 33 centimeters was recorded. Now these are unofficial, of course, and uh, we're still waiting for more numbers to come in. But Mount Pearl, about 27.4 centimeters. You can see uh, somewhere between 20 and 26 anywhere else in the city. And then uh, Terra Nova picked up about 17 centimeters of snow, Gander 13. So quite a significant uh, event. And again, if you like snow, you're in luck because there is much more where that came from as we head through the weekend. If we take a look at that future tracker, the next system will start to move in through the afternoon tomorrow, or at least the morning hours for the south coast, and then uh, continue to spread east towards uh, Gander and then eventually for the Avalon as well. And then uh, windy conditions and quite a bit of snow expected up through Labrador as well with uh, some blizzard conditions already in place or rather blizzard warnings already in place from Makovic down through to Cartwright Eagle uh, River also in that blizzard warning. Uh, Environment Canada still has a special weather statement for Happy Valley Goose Bay and towards the rest of the coast and that's because things shouldn't start to ramp up until at least tomorrow night and into Sunday but those winds will pick up. We're looking at between 20 potentially even 30 centimeters of snow for Happy Valley Goose Bay and then uh, blowing snow advisory uh, for Hopedale as well. So uh, as far as temperatures go tonight, uh, another chilly night, minus 7 for St. John's, minus 10 for Grand Falls, Windsor. Uh, and then looking at some more snow along the coast, west coast, we could pick up about 5 centimeters of snow tonight. And then up through Labrador, those winds, as I mentioned, will pick up. Now, most of the snow won't fall until Saturday for the most part. It's only looking at about 2 to 4 centimeters tonight. But those winds, so blowing snow, will be an issue through the overnight. Cartwright's actually going to see that temperature climb up to about minus 4 by morning. And then Lab City uh, still looking at that chance of flurries. Won't see much in the way of accumulation, but still that chance of flurries, that wind chill feeling closer to minus 28. Now tomorrow, temperature is a little bit warmer, hovering around the zero degree mark for St. John's. Minus single digits across the board. Uh, Marystown could see a temperature uh, likely around minus one through the day. And then St. Anthony minus five with that chance of, uh, or rather mix of sun and cloud. The rest is where we'll see that snow. And then those blizzard conditions. This is when most of the snow will fall somewhere between 20 to 30 centimeters just tomorrow. And then those strong winds. Again, Lab City just sitting uh, at about minus 15, only going to see flurries for the most part. But if we take a look at what some of the models are pointing at as far as snowfall amounts go, along the coast, down through Cartwright, could see upwards of 50 centimeters. This is just through Sunday morning. Even more so will fall through Sunday. And then uh, for the uh, island, 
that snow will start tomorrow night, or rather tomorrow afternoon-ish, and then uh, somewhere between pockets of 15 to 20 centimeters for parts of the Buren, and then uh, for the Avalon, it's looking more like five to 10 centimeters, could even see upwards of about 15 centimeters with this case. Then more snow on uh, Sunday for the West Coast, but I'll have all those details coming up. One of the most highly anticipated witnesses to testify at the Muskrat Falls inquiry is due to take the stand Monday for an expected five days of testimony. Ed Martin was the CEO of NALCOR as the plan to develop the Lower Churchill River took shape and construction began. Here now is Mark Quinn reports. If Muskrat Falls was a runaway train, then Ed Martin was the conductor. He was the CEO of Nelcor before and after the project was given a green light in 2012. His lawyer, Harold Smith, says Martin is eager to get on the stand. He's looking forward to it. He's looking forward to uh, getting his side of the story out. Muskrat Falls is now two years over schedule and billions over budget, the reason why this inquiry was called. But as recently as last week, a defiant Martin defended the project and the $6.2 billion cost estimate it was sold on. And I'm confident that that was the right estimate and was absolutely not lowballed. Not lowballed. Longtime critics disagree, and they're looking forward to Martin running the gauntlet of lawyers next week. He's a key witness. Clearly, he's a key witness. He's been involved in this project for a long time. He's a major player, has, a, has an understanding of, uh, of what's going on out there, and is the liaison, essentially, the link between the government and uh, Nelcor. Martin's lawyer hopes his client will be treated fairly. He's criticizing commission co-counsel, in his view, they appear to have already made up their minds about what happened. Commission Council will have at least two and a half days to push what appears to be a predetermination of the issues. Uh, and uh, his objective will be to try and uh, uh, ensure that uh, the bigger picture is looked at. Martin will be the 55th witness to take the stand at the inquiry. When he's done, the inquiry will end the year with testimony from Kathy Dunderdale the premier in office when Muskrat Falls was sanctioned. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. The premiers of Quebec and Newfoundland and Labrador met in Montreal last night. Quebec's Premier Francois Legault fired off an intriguing tweet that showed the pair together outside a restaurant where the Prime Minister was hosting a dinner for the premiers. And in that tweet, Legault said they spoke about the potential of hydropower and economic development between the two regions to create wealth and jobs. I was very happy uh, with the uh, private meeting I had with uh, Dwight, the uh, Premier of uh, Newfoundland, Labrador, last night, because we can work on a deal together. Uh, we both have... Uh, potential projects in hydroelectricity uh, and uh, I was very happy. Uh, only this meeting, it worked being here. Now a longtime critic of Muskrat Falls and former chair of the PUB says the government should have a mandate from the public before it asks Quebec to help bail us out. I find it very scary to think that this might be, be happening, that we might be doing some kind of a trade-off on the Upper Churchill because the Upper Churchill right now is a is a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow 2041 and uh, we don't need to we we don't need to trade that off you know uh, for uh, for short-term gain we have a financial problem today and we have to uh, we have to come to grips with that problem but we can't be stampeded again into making a decision in order to solve muskrat falls overnight <laughs> An iconic scene from the movie A Christmas Story brought to life on stage at the Holy Heart Theater. The st you go ahead. <laughs> the story of Ralphie and his quest to get an official Red Rider. Carbine action, 200 shot range model air rifle with this thing that tells time in the stock. <laughs> it's on this weekend, you get to meet some of the characters.
Welcome back. A popular holiday movie from the 1980s hits the stage at Holy Heart Theatre in St. John's tonight. At 7.30, Ralphie Parker's dream of getting a BB gun, despite opposition from many grown-ups in his life, will unfold in its premiere performance. And I popped by the show, which is set in 1940s in Cleveland, and met Ralphie, a notorious bully named Scott Farkas, and Ralphie's very concerned mother. definitely difficult at times. You know, Ralphie, he's always up to some uh, troublesome antics and he's definitely a little scallywag. And Randy, he's always hiding somewhere, who knows where, behind the couch, under the sink, anywhere in the house. That's a little odd, but he's a little angel and I love him very much. Oh, I do not like that BB gun. Um, I wish that I could just, you know, erase the thought of the BB gun from his mind. You know, it's so dangerous. I just wish that it would just be gone. Uh, I want a legendary official Red Rider 200 shot carbine action range model air rifle uh, with a compass and this thing which tells time built right into the stock. Brothers, boys, not even plastic water, pistols, and paper rubber daggers. You mean all blue? It's the best gun around, and I can use it to shoot targets and birds and squirrels, and Dad says I can shoot the bumpus hounds. <laughs> I think it's so stupid. They're just sticking together like a scared pack of sheep. They're, they're not doing anything right about their lives. I just kind of like teach them a lesson, you know? They're all just dirty little chickens heading to their school, and I think they really need to know who's boss around here. He's a sixth grader, and uh, he gets my friend Flick a lot, and he, he's all, his arm is always sore, you know? Um, I, a couple of days ago, I kind of went crazy and I beat him up, and it was probably the best moment of my life. He just caught me by surprise, that's all. It was, it was nothing. I'll, I'll teach him a lesson real soon. That BB gun of his doesn't scare me at all. Now, A Christmas Story premieres tonight at the Holy Heart Theater at 7.30, just after here and now. And there are two shows tomorrow at 2 o'clock, matinee then, and another showing at 7.30. I'm tired of fighting and dealing with people who are either unwilling or unable to help. Frustrated employees stuck in limbo. A former Ostaldi employee speaks out after the break.
Non-unionized Estaldi workers who were let go from the Muskrat Falls project are taking legal action to get the money they're owed. The 122 employees are among the hundreds forced off the site in October when Nalcor ended its agreement with Estaldi. Those employees say they're in limbo while Nalcor and its former lead contractor Estaldi are in court and the province is refusing to act until the court process is over. That won't happen until at least the new year. Mark Compton is one of the former Astaldi workers and he's in Cornerbrook. Well, Mark, how frustrated are you and the others right now? Uh, I'd say there's a varying degree of frustration, but fairly frustrated after speaking with people who are either unwilling to help or unable to help. So who do you blame for the predicament you all are in? I guess ultimately Astaldi Canada Incorporated is responsible for our wages and we're responsible for all of our individual contracts and employee agreements. So ultimately they are responsible, but the government and Nelcor all share some de degree of culpability here because they're all involved and all can affect change in the situation. Nalcor paid the unionized workers the money they were owed by Estaldi. That's weeks ago, yet nothing for your group. What do you make of that? Uh, obviously, you know, Nalcor is in, uh, in a whole lot of legal uh, disputes and, and uh, there, there's a whole lot of facets to the equations, but we felt that uh, the easiest thing for Nalcor to do for us uh, would have been to uh, to pay this amount of money and make it part of the of the dispute that they have with Estaldi. Nobody really disputes the amount of money that we're owed or the fact that we should be paid, but it's uh, it just ends up to be a, a finger-pointing game, and uh, we're still not paid. Now, Minister Siobhan Cody said a couple of days ago her hands are tied while Nalcor and Estaldi fight it out in court. Do you buy that? Not really. Um, we, we said from the beginning, and, and I got involved in the process about a month ago, I guess, when uh, it became clear that it wasn't just going to be a matter of, of writing a check. Uh, it was going to take some, some action and got involved to see if we could sort of help resolve any issues or maybe bring some, uh, bring some clarity to, to things that weren't unclear. And it started out with, well, you know, there's privacy issues and there's uh, your payroll company you won't talk to Nalcor, and we work through all those issues. Uh, but it, as I said uh, several times, it comes down to a matter of choice. I think if the government said, listen, Nalcor, get these workers paid, get it done, get it over with, and make it part of your dispute, it would be done. So you have hired O'Day Earl to act on the group's behalf. Uh, you're going to lose some of the $2 million you're owed to lawyers' fees. So why was that decision made? Uh, just to be clear, though, uh, I have retained O'Day Earl, and O'Day Earl have, have offered their services to everybody. And it, it's an ind individual choice and, and lawsuit basis. So just so we're clear on that. But the decision was made because... For me personally, I was, uh, I'm not giving up the fight to get the money that we're owed. Uh, however, we've, or I have moved from a perspective to, I've said, well, you know what, I'm tired of fighting and dealing with people who are either unwilling or unable to help. Neither of those are helping me. O'Day Earl will file a suit on my behalf. Uh, it will be uh, dealt with in, in uh, the court and the judge will say if I'm owed the money or not, and he would give the parties involved the matter of time to pay it. Well, Mark Compton, we'll leave it there. We will be watching any developments uh, around this issue. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. All right, well, let's go back to Port de Grave now. Dozens of boats in the harbor, of course. Let's see if uh, things have brightened up a bit. The broadcast Jane 80 is live from the town. So, Jane, that's a pretty cushy assignment you managed to land tonight. Yeah, it's enlightening. <laughs> oh, saying. nicely done. Uh, yeah, so I'm just going to stay out of the shot for a minute 
while uh, while Ted Dillon, cameraman Ted Dillon, captures some of the beauty. What a gorgeous scene out here. It's a perfect night for this, clear. You can see the, the bulbs, the, the color from the bulbs, the reflection in the water. It is just stunning. So all the boats uh, are lit now. It just happened in the last few minutes while we were out here. And uh, you can see people starting to make their way around the harbor. It's just gorgeous. So if you've never seen this uh, in person, I have to tell you, you have to make a drive out. Take a day during the week, come out on an evening some night or come out on the weekend. It's worth the visit. And uh, if you'd like to know more about the story, I should remind you that uh, the Land and Sea show that I did a few years ago about the whole history of this tradition will be aired on CBC television on Monday night at 7 p.m., 6.30 in most of Labrador. So you can learn all about the history and who started it and who organized it and all the players. So uh, you can learn all about that again on Monday evening and uh, you can make a trip out and see it yourself in person. Live in Portagrave Harbor, I'm Jane 80 for Here and Now. Oh. All right, good night, Jane. Makes a pretty good case, I'd say. It, yes, and I remember that land and sea piece mm -hmm. is well worth looking at. Right, so check it out if you can't head to Port de Grave. Check that out on Monday night on CBC Television. Statistics Canada released numbers today showing that unemployment is at a historic low almost everywhere. At 5.6%, the national unemployment rate for the month of November is the lowest in four decades. The increase in work seems to go from west to east with the lowest unemployment in B.C. at about 4%. Newfoundland and Labrador clocked in with the highest unemployment at about 12%. Popular tourist sites across Paris will be closed tomorrow and some 89,000 extra police officers are being deployed right across the country. The Eiffel Tower, Opera House and Louvre are among dozens of museums and tourist sites that will close over fears of violent demonstrations. Protesters are angry about rising fuel prices and they blame the French president. They're calling it the Yellow Vest Rebellion because many of the protesters are wearing bright yellow safety vests. Last weekend saw some of the worst unrest in the French capital since the student riots of 1968.
A lot of people looking forward to playing in some of that snow you delivered uh, <laughs> to us. Maybe snowshoeing, a little bit of snowshoeing. Uh, yeah. Yes, that's exactly what I want to do, that's for yeah, sure. Yeah, well, that's, <laughs> that's the fun stuff. Some of the stuff, of course, not so fun for everybody. <laughs> a lot of people feeling this guy's pain this morning. St. John's got uh, dumped on last night. The plows were out, of course. Snow blowers and shovels. Unfortunately, no snow day for the kitties, though. Uh, like these at St. Andrew's Elementary next door. Just a delayed opening, it looked like. Mm -hmm. They got a couple of hours, so they got to sleep in a little bit, but... Well, yeah, because it took that long to clear the snow That's this morning. Right. Jeez, when I woke up this shoveler. morning. Yeah. At least, it, you know, it's not, uh, it's not, you're new here, Ashley, but the <laughs> snow is usually not that portable. I, yeah, no, it's, it's like concrete. It's cement, like yeah. cement, yeah. No, so. it was actually quite enjoyable. I didn't really. That's the good snow. Yeah. Go it's sticking around for a while. It. it sure is sticking around, and we're looking at more. Uh, as we head towards the weekend. But uh, if we look into Sunday, uh, that's where we're going to see most of the snow for the West Coast. We'll take a look at that right now and we'll take a look at the future tracker. And we'll see that move in. It's actually the same low pressure system that's affecting Labrador that's going to bring that snow for uh, the West Coast in that onshore enhancement likely as well. So that's where we'll see most of the snow on Sunday, staying uh, with blizzard conditions up through the Labrador coast. And then into the rest of the day on Sunday doesn't look too bad for the rest of the island. We're looking at a mix of sun and cloud for the most part, maybe just some lingering flurries as well. So here's a look at that forecast uh, temperatures still staying below zero though. So yes, this snow will stick around uh, minus two in St. John's generally looking at minus single digits right across the board. And again, that heavy snow expected uh, for the West Coast could pick up between five, maybe 10 centimeters of snow just on Sunday. And then up along the coast, we are looking at those blizzard conditions again. Temperatures not too bad, though, sitting around minus four for Cartwright. But with um, those strong winds likely looking at a wind chill. Uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay will see most of the snow that day as well. Somewhere between 20 to potentially even 30 centimeters of snow falling from Saturday through to Sunday. And then Lab City sitting around minus 19 through the day on Sunday. So looking a little bit ahead Sunday night into Monday, we're going to see that uh, potential for flurries eventually taper off, but stick around right into Monday afternoon for the West Coast. So it's looking like a long term snowfall and then again more snow expected for Labrador. Lab City is generally staying out of this though uh, as a ridge of high pressure moves in clearing things out. Uh, as we head through the rest of the week and eventually things will clear out for the rest of Labrador as well. And then another system moves through Tuesday affecting most of the island and then that will spread towards uh, the Avalon into the afternoon. By Wednesday morning, it looks like things will generally clear out. So here's a look at the five day forecast. We've generally got uh, those temperatures hovering just near or just below zero right into midweek next week. Uh, flurry potential on Sunday, but it, late day Saturday into Sunday is when most of that snow will fall. So we could see between five to 10 centimeters as much as 15 centimeters in some cases. Uh, and then through Monday, just some more flurries expected into Tuesday. Wednesday looks like uh, things may clear out and minus three. Now for central Newfoundland, uh, just the chance on Sunday. Monday looks like actually a pretty nice day. And then temperatures dipping into the minus double digits into Tuesday evening with that chance of flurries. And then uh, Wednesday doesn't look too bad at minus four. Same thing for Western Newfoundland. We'll see that chance of flurries again, generally staying gray right across uh, right into next week, rather five to 10 centimeters possible on Sunday. And then again, hanging on to that chance of flurries could pick up a couple more centimeters there as well. And then up through Labrador, that's where things are going to be pretty stormy, especially along the coast with those blizzard conditions right through the weekend. Uh, snow will continue for Happy Valley Goose Bay into Sunday and then uh, eventually dipping into the minus double digits. And then same thing for Western Labrador uh, as far as temperatures go, but it'll stay quite nice. So just before we uh, <laughs> go to mm. break, wanted to show this photo. That is so unusual. Storm surge. Just that one shot. huge wave. wave like that. Mm -hmm. Well, Jane might be pretty close to this, so that's a hint there. That's a good hint. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you where this photo was taken coming up after the break.
birthday and anniversary greetings brought to you by Lane's Retirement Living. With a bowling alley, pool, cinema, and more, everyone wants in. Lane's Retirement Living. Sorry, only for seniors. Happy 50th wedding anniversary to Bert and Winnie Heath of Robert's Arm. Happy 60th anniversary to Jim and Betty Abbott of Ragged Harbor. They are celebrating on December 12th. Happy 50th wedding anniversary greetings to Jane and Wayne Peckham of Trinity East. Another couple celebrating their golden anniversary. Congratulations to Sam and Edith Bishop of Heart's Delight. And a happy 50th anniversary as well to Gordon and Elsie Vincent of Labrador City coming up on the 10th. And best wishes to Edgar and Florence Pink who are celebrating 59 years of marriage. Congratulations and happy 50th anniversary wishes to John and Linda Gillett of Twillingate. Happy birthday to Don Bercy, formerly of Buckins, now in Grand Falls, Windsor. Don celebrated his 90th birthday on Wednesday. And a happy 90th birthday as well to Mary LaCosta of Campbell's Creek. Happy 93rd birthday to Earl Lockyer, formerly of Tax Beach, now living in Paradise. Happy 90th birthday this Monday to Hertha Blackwood of Glovertown. Happy 95th birthday to Hazel Elliott in Botwood. Happy birthday to Minnie Randall, who will be celebrating her 91st birthday on Sunday. She's originally from Winterbrook and is now in Mount Pearl. Happy 92nd birthday to Dorman Alexander of Flat Bay, who celebrates on Wednesday. Happy 93rd birthday to Dorothy Dot Noseworthy. Coming up next Wednesday, she's from Whitburn, but is now in St. John's. And congratulations to Robert and Shirley Kerr from Goulds who are celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary. Best wishes to Bill and Alice Powers in Carboneer on their 61st wedding anniversary this past Wednesday. Garland and Rhoda Parsons of Norris Point celebrated 55 years of marriage on the 5th. And a happy 50th anniversary to Mabel and Gerald Moulton of Epworth. And a happy 95th birthday to Maud Stoyles of Grand Bank who celebrated her big day on the 6th. Happy 90th birthday to Sadie Chaffee of Gander, celebrating this Tuesday the 11th. Happy 95th birthday to Lucy Falk, originally from Labrador City, currently living in Summerside. And a big happy birthday to Ruby Hiscock from Mount Pearl, who turns 100 years old this Sunday. Nita and Martin Rideout of Twillingate are celebrating 65 years of marriage coming up on Monday the 10th. Happy 68th wedding anniversary to Gord and Helena Woodford of Lewisport. And anniversary greetings to Maud and Lambert Stacy, formerly of Labrador City, now in Clarenville. And a happy 60th wedding anniversary to George and June Keeping of Ramia, who will be celebrating their special day on Monday. And birthday greetings to Susie Grandy from Grand Bank, who turns 95 tomorrow. Also, happy 95th birthday as well to Pearl Noseworthy, Pearl is the oldest resident in Leading Tickles. We want to remind you that on Friday, December 14th, CBC is celebrating Feed NL Day to help support our local food banks. And our studio lobby here in St. John's will be open all day, accepting your cash and non-perishable food items for the Community Food Sharing Association. And we're also going to be set up at the Avalon Mall, broadcasting live throughout the day, including that evening on Here and Now. Yeah, so bring your Christmas shopping by our CBC table at the Avalon Mall. In exchange for a donation, one of us will wrap your presents. So that's next Friday, December 14th. Anthony won't be wrapping. Not really. We don't no. want him to wrap anything. I'll put the bow on them. That's about it. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. All right. So we had a gorgeous picture that we were trying to figure out where it was. Yeah. yeah. Give you a pretty good clue there. But after, uh, after blowing Cape Spear this week, lighthouses have kind of got me intimidated. <laughs> um, yeah. Fort DeGrave. That's where that shot was taken. Uh, yeah, so November storm surge is what uh, Gary Gleason said there. A uh, beautiful shot, though. It's been pretty stormy, so. Mm -hmm. Spectacular wave. Yeah, it's been definitely. really stormy, and of course, we've been talking about all fall, how high the winds have been, mm -hmm. and now they're continuing. I'm just thinking about your forcast for the Labrador coast. Yes. Remind us again, it's uh, upwards of like 100 you could K? See, yeah, 60 to 80 is a good bet, but you could see gusts upwards of 100 kilometers per hour uh, right through the weekend, so it's gonna be not a very nice weekend along the coast. Yeah. Right. But for yeah. the rest 
of us. We might get out and play. I hope yes, so. Yeah. I hope to. Try the skis and snowshoes tomorrow yeah. for Lucky. Because yeah. it doesn't stick around the Avalon that long. No. Well, right. hey, through next week at least. That's not too bad. Sure, a little bit more. <laughs> Well, we're going to wrap it up for this Friday and for the week. Thanks for watching Here and Now. Have a great weekend, everyone. Good night. See you on Monday.